Welcome to our worship service from Woodlawn Lutheran Church for April 19th. We continue the focus that started last week on Easter, uh, focusing on the reality, the truthfulness of Christ's resurrection from the dead today. We'll be following the service of the Word on page 38 in Christian worship. We begin with our opening hymn, hymn number 149, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sins and take away my guilt. God our Heavenly Father has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. O risen Lord, 
You came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and sacrament, and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The New Testament lesson for the Sunday after Easter will also be the basis of the sermon today. We read from the book of Acts, chapter 2, part of verse 14, and then verses 22 to 33. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man recommended to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man, who was handed over by God's set plan and foreknowledge, you killed by having lawless men nail him to a cross. He is the one God raised up by freeing him from the agony of death, because death was not able to hold him in its grip. Indeed, David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon my life to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Gentlemen, brothers, I can speak confidently to you about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath that he would seat one of his descendants on his throne, he saw what was coming and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, saying that he was neither abandoned to the grave nor did his flesh see decay. This Jesus is the one God has raised up. We are all witnesses of that. This is the word of our God. We'll now sing responsively Psalm 16. It's on page 68 in Christian worship.
The second lesson, the epistle lesson for this Sunday, is from the first epistle of St. Peter. We read in chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he gave us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance that is undying, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Through faith, you are being protected by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Because of this, you rejoice very much, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various kinds of trials, so that the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which passes away even though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, yet by believing in him, you're filled with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of God. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alleluia. The Gospel lesson for today is from St. John's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. After eight days, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We continue with our next hymn, hymn number 165. We'll sing verse 1 and then verses 4 to 8.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, God's word for our devotion today is based on the first lesson from the book of Acts, chapter 2. Brothers and sisters in Christ, last week uh, I watched on the Smithsonian Channel a four-part series made some years ago called The Real Jesus of Nazareth. It featured Robert Powell. He's the actor who portrayed Jesus in the 1977 movie Jesus of Nazareth. In this documentary, Powell visited a number of sites in Israel looking for archaeological evidence from the time and places Jesus lived and worked. And it was kind of cool to see the synagogue in Capernaum, part of which, the part still standing, goes from the first century A.D. Or the holy sites in Bethlehem and Jerusalem, Nazareth, and other cities. And I know people who have visited these places in Israel, and, and they've commented, as Powell did, how moving the experience was for them being in those same places, seeing the, the same things that Jesus had seen. But I was rather upset about the religious side of that program. You see, Paul met with all kinds of so-called experts on the life of Jesus and biblical scholars, both in Israel and then uh, in interviews here in the United States, who talked about the conditions in Palestine 2,000 years ago, what life and politics were like that Jesus encountered. They praised his teachings and the effect he had on the society and people of his day, but hardly a word was said about Jesus' mission, his mission of saving the world from sin. Anything that had to do with the Bible's teaching that Jesus was the Son of God was openly contradicted. The Gospels, we were told in this program, rather than being the records of those who were eyewitnesses, were said really to be, have written much later than Matthew or Mark or Luke or John lived, early second century perhaps, and that there were lots of exaggerations added to the words by devoted followers of Jesus. And so his miracles and his resurrection from the dead, anything that went beyond the realm of human reason and science, that was all said to be myths and fables, not part of the real Jesus of Nazareth. But what do we have here in Acts chapter 2? Does Peter talk as though this is myth and fable? It's Pentecost, the Jewish Thanksgiving celebration. Jerusalem is filled with out-of-town visitors who've come to worship. At the sound of a rushing wind, a large crowd gathers together at the temple, and these people hear the disciples speaking to them in their own native language about the mission and the work and, and faith in Jesus Christ. And then Peter stands up to address the whole gathering. What's the center of his message? What is driving him and the other disciples to boldly speak this message of forgiveness and salvation? And what is it that many so-called Bible scholars refuse to believe today? God has raised this Jesus to life, Peter says. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, along with his atoning death on the cross, are the keys to the Christian religion. Without them, well, we're without hope in this life, without a future for the life to come. We're like hikers lost in the woods, or a ship lost on the ocean. And that's because we cannot find or construct our own way to heaven. The Bible and even our own consciences reveal to us that, that we don't always live the way we're supposed to. You know about that conscience, you know, that little voice inside of us that tells us, that lets us know that we've done things wrong, things just aren't right in their, our behavior. You, we all know what a guilty conscience feels like, right? And then we go to God's law in the Bible and we see how, how guilty we really are. 
Bible says we're born in sin, that even our thoughts and emotions are, are stained with sin. We learn the standard, the expectations of our Creator God. It's perfection. Perfection in our relationship with Him. Perfection in our relationship with the people around us in the world. And then because of that sin, the guilt, we deserve God's punishing wrath in this life. A life that ends with death and eternal punishment in the never-ending death called hell. So whether we realize it or not, we all desperately need someone to rescue us from that sin and guilt and that curse. Jesus of Nazareth is that Savior. He alone provides the perfect payment for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's because he was perfect. He was the sinless Son of God, miraculously born of the Virgin Mary by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and he showed his divinity. Peter mentions that clearly here. Jesus the Nazarene was a man recommended to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did through him, as you yourselves know. Yeah, people, Peter and the people in this crowd they knew Jesus was more than just an itinerant preacher from rural Galilee. No, he was the perfect and powerful Son of God, attested by those signs, wonders, and miracles. And yet, though he had no sins of his own which would be cause for him to die, it was part of God's loving plan that Jesus should die. And Peter pulls no punches here when he bluntly tells the crowd that they, led by their religious leaders and and by the hands of the Roman government, had Jesus nailed to a cross. The innocent, the innocent Son of God died. But that's not the end. Despite what so-called Bible scholars and skeptics claim, God raised this Jesus to life, Peter says. The cross was not the end. Jesus' bones aren't still in some forgotten grave in Israel. No, the empty tomb provides proof positive that Jesus was the Son of God, that his work had meaning, his death had tremendous value. His sacrificial death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, bring that meaning and value to light. By pouring out his holy and precious blood, payment was made to remove the guilt, to deal with the punishment that we deserved. And his resurrection was God's the Father's stamp of approval on his son's work, that the payment was complete. Paul explained it to the Christians in Rome when he writes, Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. We are declared innocent, not guilty, because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Everything he set out to do, he accomplished. And his work met with his Father's approval. The resurrection from the dead is the guarantee of our salvation. In Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we can have a wonderful relationship again with God. What a blessing that is. Without it, we'd be lost forever. But what a display of, of God's amazing grace. The grace that, well, that found us when we were lost in our sins. And now through Jesus' work and the work of the Holy Spirit, making those blessings known to us in the gospel, the fear of death and hell and punishment are removed. Our consciences are silenced. The message of Easter fills our hearts with joy and gladness. Even when we aren't gathered together in our churches, we can have the same attitude, Peter says here, that David had as he expressed in Psalm 16, which we sang earlier, which Peter quotes here. Because of God's love and forgiveness, Israel's greatest king knew that God was at his right hand, that God's power and, and protection were, were hard at work on David's behalf. And so as a result, David knew he would not be shaken. He stood firm in that love that God showered on him. Joy and gladness were on his lips and in his heart knowing that God was on his side, that his sins no longer separated him from the Lord, that was ever so sweet and comforting. And our attitude 
can be exactly the same. Through Jesus' death on the cross, our sins have been completely forgiven. Christ's resurrection was a declaration of freedom on our part, for us. We're free from the curse of the law. Oh yes, we still sin, but now we have the desire and, and we have the ability to stay away from sin. We are free. We're on right terms with God again because of what Jesus did. Paul told the Corinthians that if Christ had not been raised, we would still be in our sins and our, our faith would be useless. There would be no point in our conducting these online services, no reason for us to share the message of Jesus with the people around us. If our hope in Jesus applies only to this life, well, Paul said we are to be pitied more than all men. What a waste of time and energy and money. But Peter says, God raised this Jesus from the dead, raised him to life. And that means the value of Christ's resurrection even goes beyond this life. Peter, again, here quotes King David as talking about his sure hope for the future. What happens to us after we die? My flesh also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon my life to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. David was saying that he wasn't going to be forgotten. Even after his corpse was placed into the tomb, the tomb, Peter says, is right here in our midst yet. David knew that one day he would rise from that tomb. He would be made alive again. And not only would he live again, but even God's chosen messenger, the special servant of the Lord, whom God was going to send, the promised Messiah, he would not even have his body see decay. He would rise again as well. Peter makes it clear that David is talking about Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was that promised Messiah whom God raised to life. This Jesus, Peter says, is the one God raised up by freeing him from the agony of death because death was not able to hold him in its grip. Yes, death was defeated in the resurrection of Christ. Death. That's Satan's trump card, isn't it? That was his big lie from the beginning. Remember what he told Eve and Adam in the garden? You're not going to die if you eat that fruit. But we know what happened. They ate and they died. And now death comes to all people because all of us sin. And it's the fear of death that has our world in such a panic these days, isn't it? Yes, we're all going to feel death sooner or later whether from COVID-19 or something else. But the fact that God raised this Jesus to life assures us that sin and death and Satan and hell have been defeated. Death is not the dread terror it once was when we were without Christ. God did not let his Holy One see decay. Easter Sunday was a victory snatched from the apparent jaws of defeat on Good Friday. Satan was dethroned. He no longer holds sway over us. His days are numbered. He's like a dog on a leash, able to bark and growl and hurt us if we cozy up to him. But he is at bay. And so we can avoid his temptations and we can counter his lies by staying close to God and his word. We are not powerless against him. We can overcome him because Jesus won the war against him. His resurrection proves it. So now we can even live without the fear of death. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we know that our bodies will not be abandoned to the grave. We can have the same joy and confidence that David had, that the Old Testament believer Job had when he expressed, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Yes, our bodies will rise from the grave to be reunited with our souls, and then we will be taken to live forever in the mansions of heaven, blessed by the unending love and presence of our living Savior. That's the confidence David was expressing. 
That's the certainty that lived in Peter's heart. That's the faith that motivates us to go through life, to face the trials and turmoil that we all experience, and especially at this time, because our faith is in Jesus, the crucified and risen Savior and Lord. Peter and the other disciples were witnesses of that risen Lord. At least 11 different appearances of Jesus are mentioned in the New Testament. And for those who ate and talked with Jesus, who touched the nail marks and saw the spear-pierced side, they were willing to go out into the world, proclaim that message, and even die for that central message of Christianity. So don't let the skeptics of this truth rob you of this blessed reality. The fact that God raised Jesus up from the dead has great meaning for you and for me. It's the heart of our work, our worship, our everyday lives. It's the mission of the church. Like Peter, like David and Job, and all true believers of the past, we must firmly believe and boldly confess God raised this Jesus to life. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. And we now join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We're not worthy of all the mercies you show us, but you've given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick. Cheer those who are sad. Calm those who are distressed and comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. And we pray all this in the name of our Savior Jesus, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now sing our closing hymn, hymn number 154. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks. our heads and pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Mm -hmm.